That's what I'm talking about. Where have you, where have you guys been all my life? Um, so good evening. I'm Mary Pat Higgins. I'm the president and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight for our final Funk Family Upstander Speaker Series of the year. Um, it's just a joy to see so many good friends and wonderful supporters of the museum. We appreciate you being here. I'd like to start by thanking our Anchor Series sponsor, IMA Financial and IMA Foundation. We appreciate your ongoing support of our Funk Family Upstander Speaker Series so much. I'd also like to thank our incredible community partners for tonight's program, Agape Clinic, Green Hill School, SMU Human Rights Program, Southwest Jewish Congress, the Legacy Senior Communities, and Temple Shalom. We're grateful for your support of the museum and for your partnership. And as always, I would like to give a warm welcome to our board members who are here, our volunteers, and our museum members. We could not do this work without all of you. I'm very grateful for your support day in and day out. If you are in the audience and you are not a museum member or a volunteer or a board member, you need to get engaged and do one of those things. So um, please continue, um, consider getting involved and supporting us. We need your help to do this, this kind of work. So the Funk Family Upstander Speaker Series was named in loving memory of Blanche and Max Goldberg and Fanny and Isaac Funk. And it was created in the spirit of the museum's mission to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference. In this series, we highlight individuals and organizations who stand up for the rights of others and for themselves and combat injustice, inequality, or unfairness. And Phyllis Fry embodies that charge. Phyllis Fry, Phyllis Randolph Fry, is an Eagle Scout, a, yep, yeah, go Scouts, a former member of the Texas A&M Corps of Cadets, an Army veteran, first lieutenant, an engineer, an attorney, a father, a grandmother, and a lesbian widow. Now, who can say that? All of those things, right? Um, she's also the first out transgender judge in the nation. She, um, let's see, I lost my place. So in 1976, when Phyllis transitioned to being out, she faced the possibility of arrest because of a Houston city ordinance prohibiting cross-dressing. After four years of her lobbying, the Houston City Council voted to repeal the ordinance in 1980. That's upstander behavior. Phyllis began the National Transgender Legal and Political Movement with six annual transgender law conferences and the grassroots training of future activists, lawyers, and bloggers. Thus, she is known as the movement's grandmother which is a, maybe a dubious honor. I'm not sure, Phyllis, but it's good. Her biography, Phyllis Fry and the Fight for Transgender Rights, was published in 2022. So we will have time for questions at the end of tonight's program. As, as always, you're familiar with the drill, hopefully. We will um, pass around note cards, or you got them when you came in. Please write your question on the note card, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible. And now, it is my great pleasure to welcome Phyllis Fry to the stage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, that was very sweet. As you know, my name is Phyllis Fry, and my pronouns are judge and your honor. While you're sitting there, I would like for you to dig out your cell phones. What? Dig out my cell phone? Yeah, I'll dig out your cell phone. Because <clears throat> I want you to Google my name. And if you Google my name, Phyllis Fry, you will find 
an article that was written in 2015 and published in the New York Times. And uh, it's about me. But the magic of it is that it was published on the front page <laughs> above the fold of a Sunday edition of the New York Times, if you can believe that. And um, <clears throat> I'm very proud of that. And about a year later, Michael Long and Shay Tuttle contacted me and they said, we would like to do your story. And so when you talk about my book, I did not write the book. I did not publish the book. I don't make a dime out of the book. But they did such a good job of telling my story that I want everybody to get the book and get an idea of all the stuff that I did and that my wife, Trish, did. Trish was my mentor. Um, Trish and I met in 1972. And uh, we became friends. And I was dealing with the fact that I knew I wanted to be a woman, but <clears throat> uh, it had caused a divorce uh, from my first marriage. It had caused the military to uh, uh, try to run me out with a general discharge, and I fought them and got an honorable discharge. And it also caused me to uh, cut my wrists. And uh, I was... Um, I know this is being taped, but I'm going to say it anyway. I was really, back then, I really was, guilt-ridden. Anyway, Trish and I met through a mutual friend, and uh, we started dating. And uh, after a while, I trusted her enough so that I told her who I might become or what was going on. Trish is a straight woman. And she said, oh, well, I've never heard of that, but um, I'm still your friend. Okay. So we continued to date, and slowly we fell in love. <clears throat> and then we decided to get married, even though she knew that I might need to become Phyllis someday. She just said, I'm, you're, you're very important to me, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So in the summer of 73, we got married. And uh, <clears throat> in, uh, during the next several years, I began to uh, transition more and more and to the point that I was uh, blackballed by the Houston engineering community because I have a bachelor's in civil engineering and a master's in mechanical engineering. And I could not get work and so uh, she said you may as well be who you are and I'll see if I can hold on so in September of 76 I became Phyllis full-time and she wanted to, she tried to hang on and she did now she was a public school teacher so here we are me unemployable even though I had two degrees. And she, being a school teacher, was terrified that she might lose her job if uh, the school district became aware of, of us as a couple. And so it was a scary time. And our income was terrible because I wasn't bringing in any money. And as you know, teachers never have gotten paid what they're due. Um, so... We cut back. One of the things we did was from 76 to 86, we did not run our air conditioner every summer in Houston, Texas. It's electric bill, folks. You know, there's stuff that you do to survive. There's just stuff that you do to survive. Well, I decided that uh, I would go back to school and use my GI Bill uh, and get a master's in business administration because I figured that uh, that would give me some income through the GI Bill and also I might meet some 
engineering managers who were also working on an MBA, and they would come to know me as a human being and as a person rather than just somebody that was talked about. Well, when I applied at the University of Houston, they had just started a new program where you would get a degree in business administration and a law degree. You had to do them both at the same time. Well, that just kept me in school longer. That just kept me getting the GI Bill for a, a longer period of time. I was fighting at that time the ordinance that made me subject to arrest. Uh, and as you can imagine, every day that Trish left the house to go teach school, she did not know when she came home if I was going to be there or if I was going to be in jail because I was out lobbying. I was out trying to find work. Uh, and I was doing grocery shopping and all the other stuff. And so she had to deal with that. I never was arrested. Sometimes I always wonder why I never was arrested. God was really looking out for me, but I never was. <clears throat> anyway, I decided that I would do both of these degrees. I really wasn't interested in practicing law, but I knew that if I became a lawyer, it might scare the hell out of the neighbors and they would finally leave us alone. And that, my friends, is why I went to law school. <laughs> and uh, I passed the bar, but I still couldn't get work. I could not get work. I could not get work. Finally, around 1986 or 87, uh, a friend of mine by the name of Ray Hill, he's a Houston activist, very well known, since deceased, but a very good friend of mine and Trisha's, <clears throat> he said, you know, Phyllis, every year or every two years, whenever we have uh, elections, uh, a lot of people who are running for judge as Democrats come to the Houston Gay and Lesbian, that's how it was known then, political caucus to screen and get the caucus endorsement. And you're always part of that screening panel. And so a lot of these judges know who you are as an individual, as a trans individual, and as, a, uh, as a, a, an attorney. And you should go to some of them and ask them if they will appoint you in the, in their, in the criminal courts to uh, represent indigent defendants. OK, so I did. And a couple of them did. I found out I was really good at it. I found out I was very good at it, and I started uh, getting more and more and more work. And by the end of the 80s, uh, I was making decent money as a lawyer. I was defending uh, those accused of crime. And we all know that everyone is presumed not guilty until proven, guilt, uh, until proven guilty. But what I found is that there were a lot of prosecutors who were good people of good faith, and they had uh, uh, defendants that uh, uh, they knew were guilty, and I knew they were guilty, and they knew they were guilty. But they, uh, the prosecutors did not want to over-punish. They just wanted to extract the legal punishment that was due, and that's all they ever asked for. And I worked with those defendants and got what we call plea bargains. And I got a lot of people some very decent uh, time, either in jail or in prison, for what they had done. And I felt, and I still feel to this day, that I was defending the Constitution by holding prosecutors' feet to the fire if they went too far. Sometimes I would have a client who the police had just... Uh-uh, the police had just not, not followed their rights at all, had over, over, gone way over. Or I run into uh, prosecutors that wanted too much time. Uh, <laughs> two of my favorite stories, <clears throat> one's a tough story, one's a funny story. I'll tell you the tough story first. I had a defendant who was a very mean man, no doubt about it. Uh, and he was charged, uh, and he had had several felonies, 
And so the way the law works is that if you have several felony convictions and you get another one, the minimum amount of time that the state can offer is 25 years. And he wanted 15. He was uh, wanting me to ask the state to ignore one of the uh, prosecutions so that he would only have one prior prosecution and the state could offer him 15 years. And, and he said he would take those 15 years. And the prosecutor was just, uh, she just wasn't going to budge. And she says, no, we'll do 25 years. And, and this went on for several months. We would reset, and I'd argue with the prosecutor. And I'd, I'd say, I don't understand this. You, you, you don't have to take this to trial. He's going to give you 15 years. She says, yeah, but he's a bad guy, and I want 25 and so one day before trial, actually it was the day before trial, I asked her, I said, how long is this jury trial going to take? And she says, oh, I can knock this one out in three days. <laughs> and I held up five fingers. <laughs> and I said, she said, you can't make a trial last for five days. And I said, watch me. <laughs> and it lasted for five days. And he was found guilty, as he should have been. And the jury gave him 43 years, of which he deserved every single one. <clears throat> but the prosecutor was counting on those extra two days of that week to get all of her homework done so that she didn't have to come into the office over the weekend. Well, she came into the office two consecutive weekends because I made her, sit, made her deal with me in a five-day trial. As a result, after that, she made very good plea bargain offers. <laughs> but my favorite story of all, I was in misdemeanor court, and I was asked to represent, bless her heart, she was a mess, a woman for uh, uh, soliciting prostitution. And it was very obvious she didn't have any education. It was very obvious she was poor as a church mouse, and she was just struggling to make it, and that's the only way she knew how to make it. And she'd been arrested for that so many times, so many times, that uh, the prosecution <clears throat> was making a horrendous uh, offer for her to plead guilty. And I said, there's no reason to plead guilty. We could, we could go to trial and lose and still not do any worse than what you're offering. And the prosecutor said, well, that's just the way it is. And I said, well, why don't we do this? We'll plead guilty. And we'll go to the judge without having any recommendation between the two of us. And you can argue what you want to the judge, and I'll argue what I want to the judge, and we'll see what the judge says. <laughs> so, so we did, <clears throat> and uh, they wanted uh, about 10 months for soliciting prostitution. <laughs> and so it was my turn. And I said, Judge, <clears throat> this is a $20 job. 20 days should be enough. And the judge says, bam, 20 days. <laughs> <laughs> well, during that time, in the mid-'80s, I also started getting calls from transgender people who were coming out. And I've got several former clients in the audience who have come up to me and reminded me of that. Uh, <clears throat> and, of course, they wanted me to change their legal name, which can be done. But most lawyers uh, at that time especially didn't know anything about transgender people. And most judges didn't know anything about transgender people. All they knew was me. And... Um, so I started taking them, uh, my clients, through and introducing them to judges and introducing me to judges, and slowly I started getting some name changes. Well, several years after I did that, a couple of the ones that I had gotten their names changed came to me and said, this was very nice, but it's not very helpful. <clears throat> and I said, what do you mean? And one of them a young trans woman said, well, my name is Susan. It used to be Ralph. And my name is Susan. And my driver's license says Susan, but it still says M. And I had another one. Excuse me. 
whose uh, name I changed to Joseph. And he had been Sharon. Well, his driver's license said Joseph F. Well, that doesn't help you a lot when you're applying for a job and a future employer wants to see your ID and they see that the uh, gender marker doesn't match the name of the presentation. They suddenly become aware that they're trans and back in the 80s and the 90s, uh, that was pretty much a reason for uh, people not to get hired. <clears throat> so I decided I was going to make, make law. <laughs> I'm a very inventive person. And so I began to argue to judges that I knew that I'd taken trans people through. I said, Judge, this makes no sense. And I went through the name and the gender marker and all that other stuff. I said, what we're doing is we're changing their name, but we're giving them an incomplete change of name. Whereas if we could change the name and the gender marker to match on the state ID. And a lot of judges bought that. And so I started taking people through court, changing both their name and their gender marker so that they ended up with driver's licenses that said Joe M or Susan F. And these people then would apply for a job and show an ID that worked so they didn't come out of the closet because a lot of people didn't want to come out of the closet uh, back then because they would have faced the same thing that I faced in the 70s and 80s when I was coming out of the closet and the engineering community uh, was blackballing me. <clears throat> so that worked pretty good uh, for a long time. And towards the end of my legal career, it, it came to me that since I'm inventing law anyway, <laughs> uh, and judges, many judges are very receptive to... Uh, our community, that what I needed was I needed to give the judge something to hang on to, something they could use as evidence. So I went to the doctors, and I put it on the doctors, and I said, you've got a client who's trans, you've been giving them hormones, uh, and they've been responding to those hormones, but they have not yet had bottom surgery, probably because they can't afford it, it's expensive. My bottom surgery cost $30,000, and I'm so glad I got it, but that's also beside the point. Uh, and so the doctors would write a medical letter to the judge and say, in my medical opinion, this person has transitioned fully. <clears throat> and so I would take people to the court that had not yet had surgery, and the judge had a piece of evidence to hang on to. And so I was changing name and gender marker and uh, sex on the birth certificate without the need for surgery. And if you want to clap for that, go ahead, because that was neat. <laughs> what else did I do? Well. <clears throat> Many of y'all have purchased uh, or are going to purchase my biography. And, and just so you'll know, it's a biography. It's not an autobiography. It was written by Michael Long and Shay Tuttle. After the, uh, after the article in the New York Times came out, and by the way, I, I pointed you to Google my name. Not only will you find that article, you'll find the book. And you will find, if you scroll down, uh, you will find my archives have been digitized. So if you are a student or if you have a kid or a grandkid or a nephew or a friend or somebody who wants to understand more about who they are or wants to get a handle on the history of the community, all of my archives have been digitized and are available. And my Wikipedia is also in there. So <clears throat> don't say, I don't understand transgender if you haven't read that stuff because I spent too much time putting it all together. Anyway, <clears throat> the book uh, came out, and I'm, I'm very pleased. And if you 
get a copy, uh, I'll be glad to uh, sign it. I'm not going to make a dime out of it. I didn't write it. I didn't publish it. But I'm so proud of the story it tells. It was dedicated to my wife. Many of you I've met tonight know that Trish, <coughs> my wife, and I were together for 48 years before she passed several years ago. I've since found love again, so things work out. Anyway, um, that's a lot of my story, and it's I've been rambling on for about 30 minutes. I think the best thing for me to do is to take questions, and uh, uh, I give long-winded answers, so we may only get three questions, <laughs> but I'll be glad to take questions if whoever's in charge of that. Um, okay. What advice or words of wisdom do you have for today's transgender kids and teens and their parents as they navigate the political and legal battles being waged in court right now? Come out of the closet. Stay out of the closet. Be proud of who you are. You know, uh, that's, that's, that's what has to happen. <clears throat> back, back in the 70s and 80s um, uh, and 90s, uh, these horrible people were uh, legislating against lesbian and gay people and lesbian and transgender people and writing restroom laws and, you know, all this other stuff. And we stood up against that and we fought and we came out of the closet and our numbers slowly increased and we did what we had to do and we went to Austin or we went to Washington, D.C. and we lobbied uh, and, and, you know, did what we had to do and uh, we uh, worked politically uh, to get our friends elected and our enemies unelected. But that's, that's what we did back then. So now they're such chicken. I'm not going to, no, I won't say it. <laughs> but they are, <clears throat> that they're going after kids. And they're going after parents of children. Uh, the parents are fighting a good fight, and I'm very proud of the parents. And I'm very proud of all the transgender people who are out, who do now go to Austin, who do go to other state capitals, who do go to Washington, D.C., and lobby. Uh, I get asked a lot, you know, are you going to join us? And I say, I did it for 30 years, thank you. It's your turn. But uh, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic. Good. At least one of us is, right? Um, you were an Eagle Scout. I could, still am. Could you share some thoughts on the Scouts' inclusion of women and LGBTQ individuals? Well, it's about time. Uh, but, yes, I still am an Eagle Scout, very proudly so. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad that, uh, you know, uh, the Girl Scouts is a wonderful organization, and uh, any girl or woman who was in the Girl Scouts and uh, went through and achieved their highest rank uh, has a lot to be proud of. But let's face it, in this world, we still honor what men do more than what women do. And so we still give more credence to being an Eagle Scout. <clears throat> and uh, now girls can join the Scouts and become Eagle Scouts. I've always put Eagle Scout on every resume I've ever done. It's wonderful. So in your biography, it, it mentioned that you had a full circle moment when you secured your judgeship. 
You spent decades subject to arrest due to anti-trans laws, but now you have the power to enforce LGBTQ le legislation that you helped pass. Could you talk more about your early days as a judge and what that felt like? Well, being a judge was kind of like being a lawyer. It was an accident. <laughs> that, was, that was the last thing on my card was to be a judge. Uh, at the time in 2010, uh, after all this stuff about turning off the air conditioner in the summer and all the other struggles we had, I was making very, very good money as a lawyer by then. And um, my friend, Anise Parker, who uh, became the first out lesbian uh, mayor of a major city, uh, she and I had been playing in lesbian softball leagues and through Democratic Party politics and through LGBTQ politics and all this stuff for decades. And so she became the mayor <clears throat> in 2010. And shortly after that, she asked me if I would be a municipal court judge because she could appoint municipal uh, court, uh, judgeships. Municipal court is mostly, not all, all but mostly, traffic court and uh, uh, I was very honored and I told Trish about it and Trish said you made me a promise that you would not seek publicity for publicity's sake if as a result of your activism uh, you got publicity or if as a result of uh, court case that you were working, you got publicity. That was one thing, but just to be get publicity for the sake of publicity uh, jeopardizes my job because of, because of that publicity. And so I said, yeah, you're right, we did make that agreement. So I turned it down. Well, about six months later, there was a case called Aragoose, which you've never heard of, but it was a big case in Houston and I was the attorney, and I was all in the newspaper, and I was all on television. I was all over the place talking about my case and my client. And I got asked again if I would be a judge, and I said, yeah, sure. And Trish said, what about a deal? And I said, honey, I'm all over the place. <laughs> and she said, yeah, yeah, you are. So I accepted my judgeship on the stipulation that I would be a, an associate judge, a part-time judge, uh, because I wanted to continue to practice law. I was making very good money as a lawyer at the time, and I did not want to give that up. But uh, I did become an associate municipal judge, and uh, I would sit on the bench one or two nights uh, a week dealing with uh, traffic cases and uh, other Class C, uh, fine only uh, offenses, and it was very satisfying work. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, the most fun I had about being a judge was marrying people. Golly, that was fun because shortly after I became a judge, within a couple of years, suddenly um, you same sex people could legally get married. And I did marry some straight couples, but I married a lot <laughs> of same-sex couples. And awesome. it was really, yeah, really a lot of fun. And, of course, then COVID came, yeah. and the municipal courthouse really didn't shut down, but it really s slowed up. And uh, then Trish got sick and other things, and so I just, I just retired from being a judge. But it was fun, and it was an honor. And, yes, I am the first out of the closet transgender judge in the nation, but I'll tell you something else. I'm actually the first one in the world, and I know that because wow. I've been saying that for over a dozen years to groups like this and online and every place. And if anybody's going to contradict anything, they're going to do it on the Internet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no one ever has. <laughs> Quite an honor. Did identifying as a lesbian ever lead the medical community to discount your status as a transgender individual? Hmm. Hmm? 
No, never. Never. What are your thoughts on the overarching discussion of what it means to fully transition, and if that means you must have surgery? Well, that's an interesting question, and I delve about that in the book, because uh, Trish, Trish was a straight woman, and she knew who I wanted to be, and she knew who I wanted to be, and she, we slowly worked it out to where I took hormones, which meant I grew breasts, I developed a tushy, um, and uh, I got my name legally changed, and my gender marker legally changed, and I lived and functioned in the world uh, as a woman, and when I became a lawyer and was practicing as a woman, and, uh, and as a judge as a woman, and all this other, but she was a straight woman. And she said, if you will stop short of surgery, we'll make it work. So what she was telling me was that if I stopped short of surgery, I got to keep her? Hell yes, I'm going to keep her. And so I didn't bother with it. Um, you know, now after she passed, I kind of thought about it. I thought, yeah. And so... Two and a half years ago, I did have surgery, and uh, it's nice. <laughs> some, some of my girlfriends at the uh, senior center who know, <laughs> they call me. <laughs> but, <laughs> we'll just leave that alone. <laughs> so many things we have to bleep, Phyllis. I don't know. <laughs> I have to what? So I said so many things on the video we have to bleep, but that's okay. He's okay. It's, it's okay, yeah. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on the current fight within the U.S. military regarding acceptance of LGBTQ individuals, particularly trans folks? We're good soldiers. We're very good soldiers. tell you about my military career they you taxpayers out there y'all wasted a lot of money on me I was uh, when I was growing up we had the draft and so I knew that I was gonna have to go into the military and when I was in high school or before high school Vietnam was starting to kick up and my father had served in World War II as an uh, as a CB as an enlisted a person in the Navy, and he wanted his two sons, of which I was one, uh, <clears throat> to be officers. And so uh, my brother and I were destined to go to Texas A&M and be in the Corps of Cadets to become uh, officers. Well, uh, my brother was ahead of me, and he got to A&M, and he told my parents, you need to send Phil, that was my name then, to this other high school in San Antonio where they have ROTC because most of the uh, kids in the Corps that I'm with, uh, first year students, they do better in the Corps if they had ROTC in high school. Yeah. So I went to Jefferson High School in San Antonio and I got into ROTC. I loved high school. I loved high school. I was uh, on the yearbook staff one year, a cappella choir one year, senior play one year. I led it on the rifle team two years. Uh, I had an A-plus average, and I was the ROTC Corps commander my senior year. Yay. And at that time, because Vietnam, there was a lot of anti-Vietnam rhetoric that was going around nationally, the Congress passed a bill <clears throat> short-term bill, but a bill nonetheless that offered 100 Army ROTC and 100 Air Force ROTC college scholarships. And uh, I got one of those. Wow. wow. You know, 100 yeah. in the whole nation, and it was a four-year wow. ROTC scholarship. And uh, the deal was at the end of it, 
I would be uh, a uh, lieutenant in the regular army, not the reserve army, but the regular army. Regular army commissions, if you don't know, that's what West Pointers get. You know, and so I was lined up for that, and I graduated, and I got mine. And uh, then later on, a couple of years later, as it became uh, obvious, because my first wife was leaving me, and it came out that I wanted to be a woman, and so they ran me out. So <clears throat> y'all wasted all that money on me, and then you wasted the GI Bill to make me the kicking lawyer I am today. <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> yeah, I know. You're going to bleep that one, too. <laughs> bleep that one, yeah. <laughs> All right, where should transgender activists focus their current attention? On elections. Amen. On elections. It's all about elections. Yeah, that's right. It's all about next November's election. Yeah. And it's not just a transgender fight. It's, it's a fight for all of us, this next election. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say on that, publicly. <laughs> Me too. Um, do you see the attitudes towards the transgender community in Texas changing anytime soon? Well, it's, it's better. I mean, right now you've got to realize who's in charge of the state government. Yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're coming out. That's all I can say is we come out. And uh, our friends know who we are, and our families know who we are, and we get a lot more support, and more and more people feel like they just have to come out. You know, this is not done on a whim. You just don't change gender on a whim. Uh, it's one of the most grueling, frightening things you could ever do because it goes against everything you've ever been taught, but it's the way it needs to be. Can you speak more to your fight to include transgender and bisexual individuals in the gay and lesbian fight for rights in the 70s and 80s? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The book spends a lot of time on that. And that's why it's called The Fight for Transgender Rights. Because in the late 70s, when I became political as a Democrat, and uh, in the 80s, when I was political, well, I've always been political, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> it was the gay community, and that's what it was. And, of course, the women felt ignored, and they were fighting for the lesbian and gay community. And I was part of that. I felt very much part of that uh, because I felt, and I still feel to this day, that I'm a lesbian, and I'm proud of it. Uh, and so we fought for that. We fought for that. Uh, and we finally got the lesbian and gay community. Well, I was also fighting for transgender recognition. recognition and the bisexual community was fighting for recognition. And we had the uh, first ever march on uh, Washington. This would have been in 80... No, 79. It was in 79, yeah. And I was there. Uh, actually, I was there leading the Texas section in that march. Wow. <clears throat> uh, but it was the March for Gay Rights. And then uh, later on in the 80s when Reagan was president, we had another march. And this was for lesbian and gay rights. Uh, this was the one where the day after the march, there was a humongous protest uh, on the steps of the United States Supreme Court where a lot of people volunteered to get themselves arrested. Um, I was not one of them. I wished I had been, but I wasn't. You know, I've always been subject to arrest in so many things that I've done. 
but I never really wanted to be arrested. And luckily, I never was. And then in 95, we had another one. This was for lesbian, gay, and bi rights. Still hadn't gotten transgender into it. But uh, I was chosen as the transgender community spokesperson. And I spoke on the mall, the Washington Mall, uh, that day. And my speech is in the book. Um, and I've read it. And it was pretty good. <laughs> Well, it was. I mean, you know, you do things like that, and you forget about them, and then 10 or 15 years later, you read them, and you think, gee whiz, that was really good. Uh, in around 89, I was really starting to fight for transgender inclusion. It was getting nowhere. And so 90 and 9, and I was fighting locally in Houston to the point that I quit the Gay and Lesbian Political Caucus, because it would not include transgender in the bylaws. And in 91, I was getting literature from all over the country from national and regional lesbian and gay organizations who would not include trans or bi. And so I began in uh, 1991, no, 1992, the first ever uh, international Conference for Transgender Law and Employment Policy, and it was in Houston. I hosted it. Trish and I hosted it. We put our credit cards on the line, hoping that we would sell enough tickets, and we did. Uh, and for the next five years, every year, <clears throat> we had another edition of the International <laughs> Conference on Transgender Law and Employment Policy. The result of all that was that there were an increasing number of lesbian gay people who did attend, not many, but who did attend, who became very much trans activists. But there were so many trans people who came and saw what they could do in the law, either as lawyers or as uh, advocates uh, petitioning and lobbying their legislators. Uh, and that, over the decades, uh, well, let me back up a little bit more. We uh, continued that fight until I got very, very ill and had to give it all up for several years, um, but I'm okay. Anyway, uh, I had to give that up for several years. But there were so many people that I had uh, mentored and excited about this that they kept up the fight. And in 2008, the last major national organization, Human Rights Campaign, finally adopted trans in its bylaws. That was the breakthrough. 2008, that was the breakthrough. And of course, after that, we've had you know, same-sex marriage decisions. We had the Lawrence decision that said um, gay sex was not criminal. We've had a lot of other good stuff. But the one case I, I'm most proud of came out in the uh, early part of 2020. And it's called Bostic. And the reason why Bostic was so important, you have to go all the way back to the 70s when I came out. And I couldn't get work. And so under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prevented discrimination in employment, on the basis of a whole lot of things, including sex. The Seventh Circuit, the Eighth Federal Circuit, and the Ninth Federal Circuit all ruled that trans were not included. And so my case, which was trying to get application of that Title VII law, was trashed. And so I had no legal protection. 
And of course, at that time, as I told you, and as I'm sure many of y'all can relate to, Trish, her job was always on the line because she was married to a woman. And so for all those decades, we dealt with that. So here comes 2020. And what Bostick said was that Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act dealing with employment discrimination based on sex included both, both, this is important, both sexual orientation, gay people, lesbian people, and gender identity, trans people. Now, why am I so proud of that? Well, there's several reasons. One is, I told you about the, what it was then. If I had been in 2020 still working or wanting to get a job or worrying about being discriminated against or whatever, that would no longer be possible. And if Trish had not retired, but was still worried about losing her job as a teacher, she wouldn't lose her job as a teacher either under the sexual orientation part. And I remember that morning, because we were, we were at the hospital. She was about seven months from dying on me, and she was taking uh, chemotherapy and stuff, and she was uh, laying there with her IV drip and all that other stuff when it came out on the news that morning. And I said, honey, do you know what this means? And she said, well, I think I do, but tell me what it means to you. And I told her, I said, this means that if you were still teaching, you couldn't get fired. And this means that if I was still trying to be an engineer or anything of that sort, I couldn't be fired. But what meant even more to me was the fact that if I had not done all that I did in the 90s with the law conferences, those six wonderful law conferences, where we trained and mentored and excited young people who became trans lawyers, we would have had Bostick being sexual orientation only. And so I am very, very, very proud that I did that. And that's why I don't shy away from the, the title grandmother of the national transgender legal and political movement. That's important. The legal movement and the political movement. Not the community. I'm not the grandmother of the community. That belongs to some other people. But of the hmm. national legal and the national political movement, that's me. Well, I think you just answered this. The, the question was, what would you say has been your most influential moment throughout your journey to gain legal acceptance for the transgender community? That was it. Bostick. That was it, yeah. Everything that led up to Boston. That's right. And all of that. You're going to enjoy the book, but let me tell you about the book. <laughs> Use the mic. Trip. Uh, Phyllis. So Phyllis. What? Mike. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me tell you about the book. <laughs> about a third of the way, you're going to be so depressed. And I know you are because a lot of people that I know who have the book, they say, I can't read any more of this. It is so depressing. You and Trish went through so much garbage. Y'all were just put upon by so many things. And uh, actually, when Michael and Shay were writing it, and I would go through the manuscript, I'd get to a point where I couldn't read the damn thing either. <laughs> It just brought back so many, so many negative memories. But if you get through it, you'll find out that I won. So, yeah, read the book. Read the book. Can you tell us about the filibusters? <laughs> Filibuster was an early blog. Uh... As you know, around 1995, the internet started really clicking and email began to click. And I was in the middle of the uh, 
transgender law conferences, the annual conferences, and slowly, as people would either come and attend or write me that they wanted to attend the next one or write me for whatever reason, they would begin to send me email. And I would begin to collect email addresses. And as uh, things went, and I really started advocating for transgender acceptance and fighting against lesbian, gay only, I began to send out these emails to my list. And my list kept growing, and my list kept growing, and my list kept growing. And it was really an early blog is what it was. And um, because my name is Phyllis, uh, we just decided to call it the filibuster. P-H-Y. Yeah. P-H-Y. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, P-H-Y, the filibuster. And that's how it uh, began. And the filibuster uh, through the late 90s and through the first decade of, of this century were very, very, very uh, influential and read by a lot of people. And I know they were because uh, a month later or so, I'd get a written uh, magazine or a written newsletter from some organization somewhere, and it would have a quote from one of the filibusters that I'd sent out uh, earlier. Phyllis, when you transitioned, what was your family's reaction? My family threw me away. Oh. My family threw me away. My father was so ashamed of me. And it really disappointed me because <clears throat> I was the middle child. Um, my brother flunked out of college twice, but he made it. Uh, he was and still is an alcoholic. Um, I was the star of the family. Mm -hmm. My little sister did well in school. She did very well in school. But, you know, I was the one who went to school on, on scholarships. When my brother graduated, my family was just almost broken financially. And here comes my turn. And I didn't cost them a dime. And I graduated with an engineering degree, not in four years, in three and a half years. And uh, I just did all this stuff. And, but, and they were very proud until I wanted to be a woman. And then religion popped up and sexism popped up and all that other stuff popped up. And my father just said, if you do this, I'll never speak to you again. And he was true to his word. Right. And my brother never spoke to me anymore. And my sister never spoke to me anymore. Oh. My mother did the best she could, but she, she was very sweet, but a very weak individual. I remember when my father died, I heard from a cousin about the funeral. And so I went. And when the minister got up to uh, do the eulogy and go through the family, I was left out, my son was left out, oh. my grandchildren were left out of the eulogy. <laughs> so the next day, I uh, got hold of the San Antonio newspaper and wrote, an, wrote my own damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good for you. And they published it. And boy, my family was furious. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, my son and I have been estranged for over 20 years. I don't have family, except I have Trisha's family. Her sister, of course, at first was dealing with homophobia and all this other stuff. But she came around, and Trisha's sister is, has just been so warm and gracious to me for about five or six years before Trish passed and since Trish has passed. Mm -hmm. Um I've had a very interesting and good love life. As I told you before, Trish was a straight woman who fell in love with me. And after she passed, and Jan, that's her sister, and I were mourning, 
uh, and grieving. And from time to time, she lives out in Castroville, west of San Antonio. We would get together and sit down and drink beer and cry over Trish. And I asked Jan, I said, uh, <coughs> what did Trish tell you about me? And she <laughs> said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> okay. Well, one day she did. And she said, Trish said that you would not do well by yourself. And Trish told me that she did not want you to mourn me, mourn her the rest of my life. And that Trish loved me so much that Trish wanted me to find love again. Huh. And that was very Trish-like. Yeah. And I've since found love again. <laughs> Another straight woman. <laughs> Who loves me? I don't know why, but uh, I'm very happy. I'm very blessed. I live in a senior center in Houston, and when Trish and I went there, we wanted to make sure there was not going to be any grief. So from the day we stepped in the front door, it was as a lesbian married couple, and I had the New York Times article on flash drives <laughs> that I was given out right and left because <laughs> I wanted people to know <clears throat> the truth was. rather than the rumor. Good for you. And uh, they fell in love with Trish. You just can't help but fall in love with Trish. And they all fell in love with Trish and they watched her slowly pass away. Uh, and they fell in love with me because of the way I took care of Trish. And uh, that senior center where I live is really a home. It really is a home. They're wonderful people. And uh, I'm glad I moved there. I don't know. I, I'm, I ramble. Go Do ahead. You, Ask me well, another question. So you talked about your son. Do you have a relationship with your grandchildren? No, I don't I'm know so them. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't know Well, them. you are a grandmother yes. to transgender youth throughout the country mm -hmm. what what would you say to them about you know how to navigate their future and what would your hope for them be come out of the closet be proud of who you are be proud of who you are yeah you just got to be you just got to be I'm very proud of who I am um, I've had a good life it's been a hard life but I've had a good life, and Trish was my mentor during all of it. You know, there were times that I was just so despondent, and she would hold me, and I would cry. And There were times when I needed counsel, and she would give it to me, and there were times when I was just really uh, doing the wrong thing, and she would sit me down and do a little course correction. <laughs> uh, she, was, she was great. You were lucky to have her. I was very blessed, yes. So there's, you know, on the, on the transgender front, on so many fronts, there's so much to be depressed about, you know, and worry about right now. What gives you hope, Phyllis, for the future? Um, just what's going on. Parents are standing up for their kids. Good. Grandparents are standing up for their grandkids. A bunch of y'all have told me before this started, you know, I got a grandkid. I got a nephew. I got a niece. I got a neighbor, you know, and uh, that's how it happens. And uh, again, as I told you, I don't make a dime out of that book, but y'all need to get that book. <laughs> it's a good, good story. Good. It's a very good story. You need to get that book, and you need to pass it around and get people to read it. Well. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for thank you for your bravery and for paving the way for so many others. Um, I, I believe that you will be in the lobby signing book. So I've, we've had a sales pitch here. Go get the book and but and have Phyllis sign it before you leave. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.